Good evening, everyone. We're uh, thrilled to have Dr. Sharma with us tonight. So to introduce myself, my name is Vince Van Dam, and I've been working with the True Freeze device for almost a decade now, and I've actually been working closely with Dr. Sharma over the years. I'm a, uh, a, a True Freeze business sales director uh, with Steris Endoscopy. Steris actually acquired the True Freeze technology in December of 2019. Uh, so we're thrilled to be a part of such a great uh, company. Um, I'll be your host this evening, myself and Stephanie. And for your awareness, you may have mentioned this, this presentation is being recorded. Um, during the event, if you have any questions or comments, please submit them using the chat box as she mentioned, and we'll address all those questions at the end. So it's, it's my absolute pleasure and, pleasure and honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma is the Director of Advanced Interventional Endoscopy in endoscopic oncology programs at Parkview Hospital uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's also the medical director of the GI oncology program. He's the president of the Parkview Cancer Institute, and he's also an as assistant professor of medicine at Indiana University. I'm actually from Indiana, and Dr. Sharma and I have been uh, working together for a long time, so not only clinically do I admire him, but he, I also consider him a good friend. So Dr. Sharma, thank you so much for your time tonight, and we're thrilled to have you. Vince, thank you so much. Uh, really kind introduction. You know, Vince was uh, with the company with CSA as it's been acquired now by Steris, for those who are not familiar with the technology. I appreciate all of you taking time out this evening to join us. I know it's a, a busy and, and kind of a different ACG this year, having everything being virtual. Uh, and again, we really appreciate the time that you're taking. I hope you get a lot of value from this lecture. What we're going to talk about today, for those who are not familiar with it, is cryotherapy, so specifically spray cryotherapy. And we're going to look at practical applications. So for those individuals who have never used cryoablation, this is a perfect introduction. For those individuals who have the technology and are looking to expand its utilization in your armamentum to take care of patients with Barrett's and esophageal cancer and various other applications. We're gonna go through specific case-based details and then we're gonna provide evidence behind those case-based details as to why we use that approach and, and the value that you'll get from utilizing spray cryotherapy in your everyday practice and how we can use it in practical applications every day. So why add cryoablation is really what we hope that you'll walk away from from this lecture. You know, looking at patients who have established Barrett's and esophageal cancer in your practice, uh, how can you utilize cryoablation in conjunction with the things that we already do? So standard screening, and you know, there's a variety of different ways in which we can screen for individuals to figure out if they have Barrett's esophagus in the setting of chronic reflux, enhanced imaging, so narrowband imaging, OCT and confocal laser under microscopy. Radiofrequency ablation, which has been the stalwart for ablative therapies within Barrett's esophagus. Endoscopic mucosal resection, and for those who do it, and endoscopic submucosal dissection are all in your tool belt, in your armamentum in order to treat Barrett's esophagus. And so now we'd like to look at some other potential technologies. And so cryoablation fits very nicely inside of that toolbox as another tool that we can utilize to better take care of these complex patients and their difficult disease. So what are our lecture objectives? We'd like to be able to display a review of some of the technical aspects of cryoablation. We'd like to review the current and future applications of cryoablation. And then we'll talk about practical tips and tricks for those individuals who have uh, spray cryotherapy at their fingertips and how they can get better visualization and better application of spray cryoablation to achieve the best possible outcomes in their practice and utilization for patients. So first and foremost, some background on cryoablation and spray cryotherapy. So the True Freeze system, which is spray cryotherapy developed by CSA and now pushed forward through Steris, uh, is, a, is a utilization platform that has liquid nitrogen that is a cryogenic agent. And essentially it cools down at negative 196 degrees Celsius. And in this form, this liquid nitro, nitro therapy will freeze tissues. And it's really more so not the freezing of the tissues that causes tissue injury. Very similar to when you get frostbite. Now, I always use this analogy with patients. It's not when your toe gets cold, but more so when you go back inside and the toe warms up that you can get decay or damage to your toe. Similarly here, our goal is to kill abnormal cells, whether that's Barrett's tissue or, uh, cry or esophageal cancer. And when we apply spray cryotherapy to that tissue, we then 
watch that tissue get cold, it hardens, and then we give it a thaw period. Oftentimes it's one minute of thaw period. And as, a, as that tissue thaws, you'll see this beefy hyperemia where it's pulling in oxygen-free radicals that lead to cellular death. Unlike heat mortalities, what's interesting about liquid nitrogen is that as it kills these cells, it actually maintains the extracellular matrix. The advantage here is that after you freeze the tissue, you're actually able to give biopsies, and those biopsies keep the extracellular matrix intact, so your pathologist can actually look at the tissue even after freezing. Here's what the unit looks like. So you have this unit inside of it, you have a uh, super cooled uh, nitrogen, and then you have a pumping device that pumps out through a catheter and you're seeing an image of the catheter there on the left-hand side of your screen. And there's timers on this unit. So you know exactly how much of the spray liquid nitrogen that you're giving. And it's basically dosed upon uh, the period of time in which you're delivering that spray. So oftentimes standard dosage is about 20 to 30 seconds. Sometimes we use longer dosages. And the value here is that the operator can control the dosimetry that's delivered. So the dosimetry that I might give an individual who has very beefy esophageal cancer that's causing luminal obstruction would be quite different than what I would utilize for a patient with standard Barrett's esophagus. So there are some contraindications to the true free system. So um, we try not to use it in patients who are pregnant, um, but most importantly, we look at patients who have uh, inability to ventilate the stomach and the small bowel. So if there's food that's identified in the stomach or the proximal duodenum at the time of the procedure, you really can't place down these ventilating tubes that you need to be able to put down to help ventilate the liquid nitrogen when it goes from liquid to gaseous state. So as it hits those tissues, it warms up. And when it warms up, we need to make sure that that uh, gaseous nitrogen gets out of that contained space in the stomach and small bowel so it does not cause damage and perforation as it expands rapidly. Uh, we oftentimes also uh, say that patients who have uh, pre-existing compromise to some of those structures like the stomach, so in the form of a peg tube, we try not to do that, or patients who have reduction in elasticity, because as you can imagine, we're cooling down these tissues and the tissues expand, the cooling and expansion, if they're not able to tolerate that, so Marfan syndrome is a great example, we uh, might not be able to deliver spray cryotherapy to those individuals. And so active ventilating is really the key here when we talk about spray liquid nitrogen therapy to maintain safety. So what is active ventilation? So when you looked at that machine that we showed you in the previous slides, active venting is a venting method in which onboard suction, which is part of that machine, is used to evacuate the gas from the ablation zone via a dual lumen cryo decompression tube or CDT. So this tube actually goes down into the stomach. There's specific lines, these two black lines that go below the GE junction and it sits there and it's a fenestrated tube that sits within the stomach and allows for ventilation of the liquid nitrogen as it turns to gaseous form to be able to alleviate uh, that gas that's inside of that contained space. And here's a very nice slide. I enjoy showing this slide when we talk about what the value is or why we have to make sure that we're ventilating. Uh, and the ventilation really provides the safety. So as liquid nitrogen goes from liquid form to gas form, it expands 700 times. So four mLs becomes three liters, for example, in a 15 second spray. So as you can imagine, as you go ahead and spray these areas and you're hitting them with this super cool nitrogen, uh, what's gonna happen is eventually it'll warm up. As it warms up, it leads to cell death which is that thawing period that I spoke of, but also that liquid nitrogen expands to a gaseous form. It's very important that we make sure we get the gas out from that contained space, and hence we have the principles of active ventilation. As long as you do that, there's a great safety profile, and I can just speak from doing this for uh, all the way back to my training period, so almost 10 years of period of time. Um, I've not experienced significant complication rates with this technology. So really the key principle is understanding that that liquid gas, liquid nitrogen will expand to a gaseous state. And as it does so, we want to make sure that we actively ventilate the stomach. One thing that we do within our unit is we have interventional endoscopy nurses that will put their hand on, this, on the patient prior to the procedure. I'll do the same thing so I can understand what the stomach looks like before we start. And then during the procedure, they're oftentimes will be just pushing against the stomach, making sure the stomach is not, and the abdomen is not expanding out of some rate that we, we're not, we don't expect. And you can see that distension monitoring. So you actually have the hand of the nurse onto the, the stomach or the abdomen and the anterior wall there. And um, you'll get a good understanding. The other thing is you really want to listen 
to the ventilation. At the minute we get the ventilating tube down, even before I pass the scope back down and begin the process of cryoablation, we immediately not only palpate the stomach, but we start suction right away. Suction is on through the entirety of the procedure. Even after I'm done cryoablating and I pull the scope out, the suction is on. That's the last thing that we turn off and the last thing that we pull out. Additionally, the nurse is there and, and has a good sense of what the stomach feels like and can stop during that period of time. And I'm constantly listening. So I can hear if that ventilation is compromised in any form. And the, the second that I hear that, I'll make sure that I stop cryoablation and make sure that that ventilation is not compromised and that we're ventilating adequately. So that look, listen, feel is so important with, with what we do in cryoablation. So here's how we approach a lesion. As you can see here on these figures on the right, figure one, two, and three, we see that targeted area. In this case, that's Barrett's tissue just above that GE junction. You can see where the top of the gastric fold is. We have an understanding of what that looks like. And perhaps we look with both high definition of white light and narrow band imaging in the beginning. And in our minds, we have an understanding of what that ablation zone is. We then will make sure that we paint that zone completely white before I start my timer. So in the case of a, a typical dosimetry for patients with run-of-the-mill Barrett's with low-grade dysplasia, we might use the 20-second three cycles or two cycles. And so what that means is we're delivering 20 seconds of spray, but we don't start that timer until the, the whole area is painted completely white. Then we start the timer. We do 20 seconds of spray therapy. Perhaps at the end, you might lose a little visualization. So it's always important to understand where your markers are on your scope and have good hand-eye coordination, good hand control. And after that 20 seconds of period of time, we take our foot off the foot pedal and we stop delivering the spray cryotherapy. And in doing so, we wait and the timer will go off for one minute of time. And as it thaws, the thing that we look for is hyperemia or redness and beefiness and sometimes even bleeding. I actually tell my nurses, uh, it's great when, when patients have a little bit of bleeding with this because I know that I'm really delivering a, a good amount of that spray and that spray is having efficacy as it warms up and thaws, those oxygen free radicals are getting in and delivering the type of tissue death that I would, I would like to see or ex expect to see with cryoablation. So really make sure that you cryofrost that entire area. That's a key tip in terms of getting the maximal efficacy uh, from this therapy. And here's what it looks like um, when you actually put the catheter through the scope. And it's very important to make sure that you have a good understanding of how much of that catheter you're putting out through the scope. That's something that I always teach our, our interventional fellows. I make sure that we have a good understanding as to how much of that catheter is out. We recognize that the catheters can freeze a little bit. They don't do so as much now with the newer generation of catheters, but in the past they could freeze just a little bit. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we have a good understanding of exactly what that looks like and how much catheter is out and delivered to the, to the patient. And here's that decompression tube that I spoke of. So as we have a cap on the tip of the scope, which provides a little better um, visualization, we have the catheter out, perhaps a couple of millimeters ahead of that cap. We now have the ability to see through that area. Before we do anything, as I said, we go down to the antrum of the stomach. We will usually use what's uh, an ERCP guide wire. We'll drop that into the antrum of the stomach. I'll remove the scope through an exchange, and then I'll put this catheter before we start cryoablation. This catheter is that fenestrated tube that I spoke of. I always know my measurements, so basic principles of even uh, assessing Barrett's esophagus is understanding where the top of the Barrett's is, where the gastric folds are, what circumferential disease versus non-circumferential disease, and where the diaphragmatic pinch is, because all those things give you your adequate measurements. Once you know those principles, the principles that we learn in just assessing Barrett's esophagus, we know exactly kind of where these double black lines are. They need to be about one centimeter below the GE junction. And once they're one centimeter below the G junction, we go down and we confirm that with the scope, with the cap on the scope. We'll then pull the guide wire out and then we'll go ahead and put the catheter down and we'll deliver the spray cryotherapy. And here you can see a cross section of what that catheter looks like. But immediately once the catheter is in place, we're hitting suction before we're doing anything else. And you'll hear the active ventilation of that suction throughout the entirety of the procedure. Almost becomes a very common sound if you're doing enough cryoablation on a regular basis. Here's just another just demonstration. What's good um, availability right now is that we have both the 16 French and a 20 French tube. It's important to notice that there's a different uh, amount of thickness and amount of flexibility of those tubes. So sometimes we use the 20 French tube because it's a little bit um, more dense. And sometimes we use a 16 French tube because it's a very narrow area, like in the instance of an obstructing esophageal can cancer. So it's good to have, be able to have both options, the 16 and 20 French tube. 
From here, I want to jump directly into scenarios because I think it's really important to understand what are the practical applications of cryoablation. Once we know what those practical applications are, we know kind of how to get implemented in everyday practice. And at the end, we'll summarize these six different scenarios so you know six practical applications in which you can add cryoablation to your standard of care. If you already have RFA, if you're already treating with EMR, why would you want to go ahead and expand to cryoablation? If you already have the CSA technology, these might be some things that you haven't thought of before that are backed up by evidence uh, that are great implementation for cryoablation and spray cryotherapy. So scenario number one, a 64-year-old male with a metal aortic valve replacement. He's considered high risk for thromboembolic events. He has an excellent functional status. He's referred for long segment Barrett's with low grade dysplasia, having long segment disease. Uh, this gentleman, and these are all real cases of my own, uh, is a gentleman who has slight amount of obesity. He's a white male. He has long segment disease. He has low grade dysplasia. He had a prior history of smoking. So he has all the risk factors for developing esophageal cancer. But he's 64, has a normal ejection fraction, aside from this uh, aortic valve, it's a great functional status. So he really wants to get treated for his long segment variants with low grade dysplasia. So after we take a look at that area, we find we have eight centimeters of Barrett's, low grade dysplasia, but no, mad, no nodularity. So the question is, what's the next step? Should we keep this gentleman with high risk, long segment disease on just surveillance alone when he's asking for treatment and he has multiple risk factors for, for disease progression? Do we use radiofrequency ablation, recognizing uh, that he has an aortic valve um, and he can't come off anticoagulation? Do we use endoscopic mucosal resection or do we do cryoablation? So this gentleman was chosen to have cryoablation. And why was he chosen to have cryoablation? Trying to do EMR for eight centimeters of, of disease uh, is really not practical. And again, bridging this gentleman could happen, but he's at very high risk for any period of time that he's off of his Coumadin and aspirin. And they really, the cardiologist would really like to maintain one that he's a mechanical aortic valve and risk a high risk of thromboembolic events. We know that because you're on blood thinners, uh, you can't do radiofrequency ablation. And so we try not to bridge these individuals. If you ever talk to your patient about what bridging is like, you use Glovinox shots, et cetera, you recognize that there's not only uh, a difficulty in getting the shots, uh, but there's a lot of coordination required and there's a, a lot of cost required. Uh, back in 2010, we had presented here at ACG an abstract, myself and Dr. Barthel, uh, of 47 patients who are on platelet inhibitor and or Coumadin plus or minus aspirin. So they were heavily anticoagulated patients. All received cryospray therapy. We had 118 uh, sessions of cryospray therapy and across the 118 sessions, there was no reportable bleeding in these individuals. So it's very safe to continue these individuals on their anticoagulation and deliver spray cryotherapy. So you can imagine there's uh, less difficulty for the patient in terms of the complications of, of trying to go out and get Lovenox, et cetera. There's less risk of thromboembolic vents and there's less cost for the patient. So this patient was chosen to be on cryoablation and uh, was eradicated from his disease. Case scenario number two, we have a 58 year old male with a past medical history of obesity and smoking, had prior history of Barrett's esophagus with high grade dysplasia. This patient was treated with endoscopic mucosal resection and then radiofrequency ablation uh, by my colleagues and friends at University of Chicago. The patient then moved, ended up developing a recurrence got a repeat treatment when living in Ohio with, uh, at Cleveland Clinic with radiofrequency ablation, got lost to follow up, uh, called back to them after he moved to Indiana, and then they called over and uh, was asked to be seen by myself for a consideration of repeat assessment and possible treatment. The normal CT of his chest, he has known very poor esophageal motility, which is probably why he had recurrence. He has poor esophageal motility, he has obesity and reflux, so with poor control of his reflux and a high acid state, he's getting recurrence of this disease. High-grade dysplasia is now considered carcinoma in situ, and all your oncology friends will be able to tell you that this is you know, essentially carcinoma in situ for a very deadly cancer. Esophageal cancer has a 19.5% survival at five years, and now we have this carcinoma in situ. It would make sense to want to be very aggressive in treatment for this, this individual. So he's referred for long segment variants with high grade dysplasia. We performed an upper endoscopy to assess his disease. He's shown to have flat, uh, flat disease with multifocal high grade dysplasia with islands of neosquamous epithelium. He's got four to five centimeter hiatal hernia as well. And that's again, why he's probably having reflux. This large patchless hiatal hernia is leading to uh, recurrent disease 
and recurrence of his high-grade dysplasia. So we need to come up with a treatment plan for this individual. What's the next step? Number one, hiatal hernia repair. This was considered. The patient has a very poor motility, um, and it was thought that despite hiatal hernia repair, we'd need some sort of a fundoplication. Number two, uh, upper endoscopy with the radiofrequency ablation in this individual who's had two different attempts at radiofrequency ablation against recurrent disease. Upper endoscopy with endoscopic mucosal resection. Again, he's got a fairly long segment of disease, limited nodularity. And then finally, maximize his PPI therapy, uh, do an end upper endoscopy and do cryoablation. So here's a really nice article that takes a look at from GIE at salvage cryoablation after failed RFA for Barrett's esophagus and looking at its effectiveness as well as its safety. And Doug Plaska was kind of the senior author on, on this whole study. Essentially the conclusion after looking at 121 patients who underwent RFA for Barrett's esophagus with dysplasia, and you can see about over half of these had high grade dysplasia like our gentleman here. Um, they looked at the efficacy of total eradication for these patients using spray cryotherapy, and they found essentially in their conclusion that patients with a refractory dysplasia or recurrent dysplasia after radiofrequency ablation, salvage cryotherapy is safe and effective. And that's what we gave this gentleman. I follow this gentleman to this day. He's been eradicated uh, from his high-grade dysplasia. He's had um, good maintenance of eradication and is doing quite well. So this is a great example of how cryospray may be used as salvage ablation for those individuals who have failed RFA. So case number three, this is a 72 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension, reflux, obesity, and smoking. He's had an upper endoscopy for increased reflux. Up, an upper endoscopy shows a 2.4 centimeter esophageal mass arising in the background of six centimeters of Barrett's. Biopsies were taken showing adenocarcinoma, at least PT1A. He gets CT scans, gets staged with CTs and endoscopic ultrasound. He gets revaluated at our multidisciplinary tumor board. He undergoes successful endoscopic mucosal resection of the mass, which shows final pathology to be a PT1A uh, tumor with normal submucosa, no submucosal involvement. A uh, patient who has residual Barrett's esophagus, he's got mild nodularity uh, left behind. What's the next step? Continue to try to eradicate all six centimeters of endoscopic mucosal resection, form an upper endoscopy with radio frequency ablation, perform chemotherapy and radiation, send the patient for an esophagectomy, or do an upper endoscopy with cryoablation. So talking through this, you know, could we do some additional EMR? We could. Will we eradicate all six centimeters with that without a high stricture rate or putting you through multiple sessions? Uh, most likely, you know, we do implement now ESD. So this would be a patient that we would consider potentially uh, going back and, and ESDing the entire area. However, that does come with some risks and morbidity as well. But that would be a reasonable consideration. And it's common mucosal resection for such a large segment would probably be not in my armamentum. I'd probably reflex myself over to ESD if I was going to resect. Uh, radiofrequency ablation, again, he's had aggressive disease. He has a little bit of nodularity left behind. I really want good depth of penetration. This is a great time to talk about depth of penetration. So when we look at depth of penetration, we have to understand that radiofrequency ablation is going to go um, really in the epithelial layer, down to the muscularis mucosa, but not deeper into that submucosal layer. Versus if we turn up the amount of cryoablation that we do, doing 30 seconds, um, three sessions with one minute thaw sessions, we know we get some submucosal penetration, which is really good here because I want to be aggressive. And I think that's what's unique is that we can control the dosimetry with cryoablation and get more depth of penetration than radiofrequency ablation. Uh, esophagectomy would be inappropriate, so with chemotherapy and radiation, it would not follow NCCN guidelines. So if you look at NCCN guidelines, they now prefer an individual like this to go to a center that performs uh, some form of ablative therapy and has ability to do that or ESD or EMR and get that as a preferred therapy over a self-ejectomy. Chemotherapy and radiation would be safe for patients with T2 disease or nodal disease. So really it leaves us down with upper endoscopy with cryoablation, which is what we did. Where is the data behind this? So again, another paper published in 2017, Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Doug Plaska was involved with this, so it was with a call uh, at Rochester and Dr. Trinidad as well at NYU. Uh, so some friends of ours who do quite a bit of cryotherapy and quite a bit of work with Barrett's esophagus. And here you can look at the efficacy of spray cryotherapy. 
uh, in patients with Barrett's esophagus after doing endoscopic resection of intramucosal cancer, it's a multi-site study, and their conclusion showed that cryotherapy is a safe and effective tool for eradication of Barrett's esophagus dysplasia after endoscopic mucosal resection for intramucosal carcinoma. And development of invasive cancer is low for this high-risk group. So essentially, you stratify them back, you use liquid nitrogen, uh, you looked at it and compared it to RFA. Patients did really well with the spray cryotherapy after resecting their cancer. So this has become kind of our practice here. We try to be really aggressive. We recognize that these individuals with Barrett's, they're part of that strata. Not all Barrett's is biologically the same. You know, as most individuals on this lecture may know and recognize that published in New England Journal uh, through one of my mentors, Nick Shaheen, it's about a 0.5% rate for all comers per year for development of esophageal cancer from Barrett's esophagus. However, those individuals who already developed high-grade dysplasia or low-grade dysplasia, we know they're on that pathway. And those individuals who develop cancer likely have even more biologically aggressive disease. So we want to be aggressive with our treatments. So cray spry out therapy, the bottom line is, may be used as adjuvant treatment post-EMR in the setting of high-grade dysplasia, which is intramucosal cancer uh, or T1A esophageal cancers. Scenario number four. A 53-year-old male with a history of reflux, cholecystectomy, smoking, esophageal cancer. He has a T3, N1, M0 disease. He gets chemotherapy and radiation. So as explained, T2, definitely T3 disease, but in many centers, T2 disease, and definitely nodal disease has great um, data for doing upfront neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation flawed by esophagectomy. So this individual went through our tumor board process, got standard of care with neoadjuvant approach of chemotherapy and radiation and then gets an esophagectomy. Three months after treatment, his PET scan is normal. We're asked to do an upper endoscopy. So he's essentially now has an esophagectomy, was considered with negative margins to be disease-free. And here's his upper endoscopy that he sent for, just to check and see how he's doing. He's on his PPI therapy. He now shows that the upper endoscopy shows that the, there's an intact anastomosis, no stricture, there's some visible sutures, not unexpected uh, with an individual like this who's undergone esophagectomy. And we can see that there's 1.5 centimeters of Barrett's above the anastomosis. So now we have a cuff of Barrett's esophagus in an individual who already had developed an aggressive mid-stage esophageal cancer, T3N1, has undergone esophagectomy. The biopsy of this Barrett's does not show dysplasia at this point in time. What do you do with this individual? So I'll tell you when I did um, my general GI training before interventional endoscopy, I spent a lot of time at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, James Barthel, who I mentioned in a previous publication that we did together, I was one of the four, four leaders in terms of Cray's biotherapy in the United States that period of time, around 2010 to 2012. And he did a lot of investigational work around esophageal cancer, looking at local recurrences what we found is some of these individuals have a cuff of Barrett's that's left behind in their esophagectomy specimen. So the specimen will say negative margins for cancer, but there's a cuff of Barrett's that's left behind. We know this is biologically active Barrett's esophagus. We know that this Barrett's esophagus has at some point in the past led to the development of cancer. So the question is, what do you do with these individuals? Do you leave that couple of bears behind? If you do, you better do a lot of surveillance because there is a chance of having local recurrences. And that's really because there's that couple of bears and it regenerates towards cancer. So what's the next step in this individual? We'll offer an additional endoscopic mucosal resection, resecting over that anastomosis. Do we do observation only? Reasonable, but obviously patients have a lot of apprehension and we know that this is not regular Barrett's in the sense that it's biologically active. Do we do RFA over that staple or suture line? Do we do chemotherapy and radiation or do we consider cryoablation? I think this goes back to an earlier point that we leave the cellular matrix intact with cryoablation. Radiofrequency ablation, especially if there's staples there, would be considered contraindicated. You're putting thermal energy onto that uh, anastomotic line. And there's definitely at least a pause around that. Additionally, EMR could be performed. Again, it really depends on the anatomy here. You know, we have a, a fairly recent esophagectomy individual. Uh, you might want to at least consider twice, but uh, it could potentially be done. Observation, as I mentioned, if you're going to observe this individual, you're going to stratify them to aggressive uh, upper endoscopies to make sure that this does not progress, but there is a higher likelihood that this will progress. And then there's the choice of chemotherapy and radiation. The individual has already had maximal chemo radiation, at least to that area in the neoadjuvant approach, and chemotherapy and radiation may be 
and overkill. It's also important to note that there have been some studies that have shown the resistance of Barrett's esophagus to chemotherapy and radiation. And final choice is upper endoscopy with cryoablation. So here's James Barthel and that group, Steve Cusera, Cynthia Harris, Ken Meredith, uh, and that whole group is out of uh, Moffitt Cancer Center where I had done some training. What they did was they looked at a background of individuals uh, who may have some local recurrence risks. And what they found is dysplastic or non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, Barrett's esophagus epithelium will persist after chemotherapy and radiation. And if it's left behind, that there's a reasonable chance that they can have progression uh, towards esophageal adenocarcinoma. And they looked at doing cryoablation in these individuals that had chemo radiation in these fields before. And they found that it's both safe and effective for persistent Barrett's esophagus after definitive chemotherapy radiation. So this would be a reasonable thing to consider in this individual who got neo neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation and now has uh, a cuff of Barrett's esophagus left behind uh, despite maximal esophagectomy. So Cray spiral therapy may be used for treatment of residual Barrett's esophagus post chemotherapy and radiation and or esophagectomy to prevent local recurrence of disease. And here we're gonna show you a little video of what it looks like um, post-treatment of esophageal cancer. So here you're seeing that cap on the tip of the scope. What you're seeing is a small amount of that cath catheter out. We have a 72 year old male, T2, N0, M0, esophageal adenocarcinoma, 15 weeks chemotherapy and radiation. He's not a candidate for esophagectomy. He's on chronic Coumadin. At eight weeks after chemotherapy and radiation, he gets a PET scan that shows some slight uptake at the GE junction. Upper endoscopy at biopsies reveal low grade and high grade Barrett's esophagus. That's left behind. I just told you that after chemotherapy and radiation, you might still have Barrett's as refractory to uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Here, seeing what I showed you, there is the placement of the suction catheter. And again, it's very important that we make sure that we're measuring those, those spots. I'm gonna rewind this just a little bit here so you guys can all take a look. What we do is we do our upper endoscopy. We assess where the diaphragmatic pinch is. We assess where the top of the gastric folds are. And we assess where the top of the Barrett's is. We take our measurements. After we do that, we're gonna place this guide wire into the antrum of the stomach, which is what we've done here. After we place this guide wire into the antrum of the stomach, we'll pull back and do an exchange. We'll remove the endoscope, leaving the guide wire in place. Now that we've done our measurement, you can see those two black lines that you just saw there. And those two black lines are placed one centimeter below the GE junction. You can see the Barrett's that's left behind here after that chemotherapy and radiation. So again, I'm bringing this back just a little bit so you can take a look. You see those two black lines are very subtle just behind this and they're, they're pointed out right here, the two black lines. They're one centimeter below this diaphragmatic pinch, which is what I look at when I think about the G junction because that complex G junction is more of a generic term. It can also mean top of the gastric fold. We're leaving that down in that area. Then we're gonna pull the guide wire out and leave that active fenestrated active ventilation tube and hit suction right away. You'll hear that suction sound go off you know your tube is in the right spot. You'll pass the scope back down. As you pass the scope back down, you have the cap on it and the catheter will be in place. And this is a nice picture here of showing top of the gastric folds, the cuff of Barrett's above that area, some more islands of Barrett's. And now we're gonna give our first treatment of cryoablation. We're gonna deliver a 30 second cycle. And as I said before, we don't start the timer until we make sure that we've whited out that whole area that has uh, Barrett's esophagus that we wanna make sure that we treat. So we're whiting out this area. Another big thing we do is called uh, cupping. So I'm, I'm always teaching our fellows that you wanna constantly be moving your hands. This is a non-contact therapy. So if the catheter does touch the, the side of the mucosa, it can stick to that area. And so we're doing this cupping motion where we're rotating or torquing that scope. So as that scope is spinning, we're making sure we're doing this cupping motion and treating 180 degrees and 180 degrees and, and nicely painting that area. And so there's a lot of uh, physical movement when you're doing spray cryotherapy. Uh, you're constantly consider moving your hands and rotating that scope and making sure that there's not contact and that you're getting good visualization. This will promote good visualization, but also promote coating of that area. 
Now you're seeing some redness and a little bit of that hyperemia that you would expect as the tissue thaws, maybe even a little bit of bleeding can occur and that's okay. It's a very self-limited bleeding, uh, but that means that we're having the kind of efficacy that we'd expect. Those stall periods are standard one minute. Now we're delivering our third treatment to this area. We did three cycles of 30 seconds at 360 degrees. Sometimes we get really long segments. We'll do 180, 180 instead of doing 360. The 180, 180 just ensures that we get really good coverage and treatment for this individual. And I really like this slide. I want to include this slide in here so everyone understands what the wall layers look like and we start talking into the technical aspects of staging Barrett's esophagus and early esophageal cancer. So what you're seeing on the left is high-grade dysplasia. That's intramucosal carcinoma or carcinoma in situ. As it starts to invade a little bit deeper into that deep mucosa and part of that basement membrane and even muscularis propria, that's considered a T1A. T1B actually goes beyond the muscularis uh, mucosa and down into the submucosa. Once you're into the submucosa, that's T1B disease. T2 disease implies that you've invaded into the muscularis propria. There's no serosa here on the esophagus. So if you go beyond the muscularis propria, which is this slide over here, this is T3 disease, you're seeing it's invading some of the adventitia around the esophagus. And T4 disease, which is actually now subdivided into T4A versus T4B, means that it's invading into some adjacent structures T4A could mean that it's still resectable, perhaps it's touching the pleura of the lung. T4B implies that it's non-resectable, and like in this picture, perhaps invading the aorta. And I really like this slide as well. So this starts to talk about some of that depth that I mentioned before. Radiofrequency ablation has a limited depth, maybe going down to the, through that lamina propria, but probably not much more than the top of the muscular mucosa. We know that uh, PDT, which is that photodynamic therapy, potentially APC as we now have hybrid APC, but definitely cryoablation based upon animal models and original testing both in the lung and the esophagus has some submucosal invasion, invasion uh, and the ability to treat into that submucosa a little bit, which is great for some of these patients who have a prior history of cancer. What's also really nice about that is you can control the dosimetry. So yes, there is some operator variability, uh, and that's why we mentioned some of the key tips and tricks to maximize that efficacy of the delivery of cryoablation. But there's also a great operator control, control that you can't get uh, perhaps when you use radiofrequency ablation, for example. You know that radiofrequency ablation will deliver a reliable, consistent 12 joules per centimeter squared, but you can't get anything more. So sometimes if you want to get something more and you want to get more depth of penetration, switching over to cryoablation, you can change the dosimetry by giving either longer treatment sessions decreasing the interval between treatment sessions. So for the example of esophageal cancer, I may bring someone back in two to four weeks as opposed to that eight to 12 week period, which is standard for Barrett's, uh, or just giving more, more cycles, longer cycles of treatment. And that's all valuable. And then you can see the depth of EMR and ESD going down to that muscularis propria layer. And then the full thickness, that surgical depth when we do an esophagectomy goes all the way through. So here's scenario number five. We have an 84-year-old male with a past medical history of coronary artery disease, reflux, COPD, and hypertension, has an upper endoscopy for dysphagia. So there's a very large mass in the distal esophagus, only able to pass the upper scope with some resistance. A standard upper scope being about 8.8 .8 millimeters in diameter. Patient gets endoscopic ultrasound, and CT scans, and a stage as a T2, N0, N0 esophageal cancer. Biopsies are shown, showing, taken, showing it had no carcinoma. Patient is HER2 negative. These are valued at multidisciplinary tumor boards, considered not a surgical candidate, candidate after evaluation by multiple specialties, as well as a thoracic surgeon. Patient wants only palliation, can't swallow, not feeling good. We put a stent in place on this individual. And again, these are all real scenarios. Just unable to tolerate the stent, despite the optimal diameter that we would choose, and the least amount of radial force from the stent. So would like to still continue oral intake and is still considering perhaps maybe I wanna have some chemotherapy, not quite sure. What's the next step? Should we add cryoablation, consider a radiation oncology referral? Should we just, should we pull the stent out that he's not tolerating well, add cryoablation? Um, or um, should we remove the stent and place a peg or should we just send the patient to hospice? So what's important here is that we can truly palliate dysphagia and esophageal cancer. We can do it with the stent or without the stent. So if we wanna leave the stent in place and treat through there, eventually understand that we're gonna really shrink that stricture down. We can pull the stent out later, great. Um, so sometimes we use the stent as a bridge. 
Otherwise, if the patient can't tolerate the stent in this scenario, we pull the stent out and we tell them, look, we're gonna bring you here every uh, couple of weeks until we can really freeze down that tumor and open the area up. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll do cryoablation and we'll do a dilation right after. It keeps that cellular matrix intact, intact, but because it's frozen, it can really help with that stricturing and have a little better efficacy. As you know, if you dilate just against esophageal cancer alone, those dilations, that tissue is compliant, it won't really do much. But if you ablate the tissue, slowly getting rid of that tissue and combine it with dilation, decrease the frequency of those ablation periods, you can really palliate these patients. And we've had multiple studies. Uh, one study that uh, Dr. Shaheen, who I trained with at UNC, is uh, one of the senior authors on, uh, it's getting ready to be shown in GI ASCO this upcoming January. Uh, that was a multi-site study looking at palliation of esophageal cancer uh, in the setting of patients uh, who have significant dysphagia and no longer want chemotherapy or radiation um, and have, are not esophageal surgery candidates. We also have an active study going on right now with Tuba Kashami over at Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Phoenix. Uh, that site is also a multi-site study and we're doing palliation for dysphagia with chemotherapy plus cryoablation. What's been interesting about that trial is we've had some individuals who have even gone completely into remission combination with chemotherapy. I think the bottom line is, this is a really great tool, it helps patients with dysphagia. Dysphagia is a real problem for these individuals. It's not only a quality of life problem, but it can be a life-threatening ailment if patients get aspiration and get sick um, from the fact that they can't swallow. Last case here, case scenario number six is a 58-year-old male with a history of reflux, appendectomy, cholecystectomy, and smoking, developed esophageal cancer, has a T3N1M0 esophageal cancer, has underwent chemotherapy and radiation, had esophagectomy. Six-month post-treatment PET scan shows uptake in the, in the residual esophagus at the anastomosis only, no nodal or metastatic disease. We do an upper endoscopy and the patient has a recurrence just above the anastomosis. He has a great functional status. What do we do next? Do we add additional endoscopic mucosal resection for an invasive esophageal cancer? Do we do observation only despite the fact that he has symptoms? Do we add additional radiation? Again, he's been maximized on radiation, so I don't think there's a value in adding additional radiation. Do we do an upper endoscopy with cryoablation plus or minus chemotherapy? So as I mentioned, you know, esophageal cancer has efficacy. It's been published multiple times around uh, around using endoscopic spray cryotherapy for esophageal cancer. It's a great study by Dr. Greenwald, senior author being Dr. Wolfson, multi-site study looking originally at the value in esophageal cancer, its safety, its efficacy. As I mentioned, there's two other studies that we're, one we just concluded, another one that we're a part of that's actively going, even looking at it combined with chemotherapy. Radiation has been maximized in this individual. For this particular study that I'm highlighting here, we looked at um, complete eradication of luminal cancer, and out adverse events. We looked at our results and you can see there were 79 subjects that were enrolled. They followed these subjects um, for a period of time. And what they've essentially found in an average follow-up of about 8.4 months for these individuals uh, who have cancer, that the spray cryotherapy is well tolerated. It also helped alleviate a lot of the dysphagia symptoms um, and could even lead to some complete eradication in individuals. So spray cryotherapy can be used for salvage treatment for locally advanced esophageal cancer is the bottom line in, that, in this scenario. And we know that endoscopic applications of cryo ablate, cryospray ablation have value in Barrett's esophagus and beyond. So I really like this study uh, that kind of highlights a variety of these different applications that we've mentioned here before. And really there's more to be studied for spray cryoablation as we continue to expand its indications of utilization. But highlighting these six scenarios, we wanna point out what some of the applications are in the real world scenarios that I, that I mentioned to you. Number one, that high risk anticoagulation patients could still need ablation. And one way that we can ablate them is through spray cryotherapy without having to bridge these individuals. So that's safe to do so. There's less cost and also less um, complexity for the patient plus less risk of thromboembolic events. Salvage cryoablation for those individuals who may have failed RFA. So we use that case scenario. Uh, adjuvant treatment for patients who have post endoscopic mucosal resection in the setting of high grade dysplasia and or intramucosal esophageal cancer. We can use spray cryoablation for the treatment of visual Barrett's after treatment of esophageal adenocarcinoma as we know that some Barrett's may be refractory to chemotherapy radiation. Number five, we can use spray cryotherapy in the palliation of dysphagia for 
esophageal adenocarcinoma. And finally, we can use it as a salvage treatment for local focal esophageal adenocarcinoma when there's recurrence and non-resectable disease. You can use it with or without chemotherapy. My last slide, I'd like to talk about some tips and tricks. I think that video that I showed you is a really great example, but some keys if you have this therapy and you wanna get optimal um, efficacy from treating patients using spray crowd therapy. Number one, obviously visualization is important. You wanna make sure there's no water in the channel of the scope, no spit, no saliva. And so when we pass the scope back down after the suction catheter is in place, we always have a syringe. A syringe has a little modified bevel that we actually stick down into the channel of the scope and we'll spray two to five times, just really clean that channel of the scope before we pass the catheter down. As you can imagine, if you pass the catheter down and there's a bunch of um, debris and or liquid or spit in that channel of the scope, you can actually get onto the catheter and you think you're spraying, but you're actually not. The length of the probe from the lens has to be optimized. And I'll show you some video examples of that. You want a couple of millimeters out. You don't want it too far out to where you have no control over the spray. You also don't want it too far into the cap. Otherwise it's gonna spray back into the cap. You won't have any visualization. Use the cap, the cap is great. It's just a simple cap that we add on the, on the tip of the end of the scope. Um, application, using that cupping technique, what I talked about, that 180, spinning around, actively moving your hands, make sure you're not in contact with the mucosa because it's not a non-contact therapy. And then don't start the timer until you see the white. Make sure you've whited out that treatment zone completely, then start the timer. Otherwise, you're not actually giving the dosage that you think you are. And then understanding dosimetry. You're the operator, you're in control of the dosimetry, which is the value and advantage to spray cryotherapy. So you can change the dosimetry, you can increase the dosimetry either by increasing the spray time from 20 seconds to 30 seconds, or sometimes in bulky esophageal disease, even a little more than that, or um, by doing more than two, doing up to three sessions in one setting with a one minute thaw, or decreasing the time in which you bring the patient back. So rather than the eight to 12 week standard for Barrett's esophagus, maybe it's very nodular, high grade dysplasia, maybe it's cancer, you can actually bring patients back. And I brought them back as little as two to four weeks to make sure that I get that efficacy and palliate that dysphagia. I'm gonna stop the slideshow here and ask if there's any questions uh, for anyone. Sharma, hey, this is Vince. Uh, thank you so much for the insightful and informative presentation. We actually have a couple here that came into the Q&A in the chat session, so I'm going to read them to you, okay? Right. So here's the first one. Are your treatment times as long for patients who are on blood thinners compared to those who are not? Uh, so the question is, you know, are we treating the same amount? So if I had a patient with Barrett's esophagus, and I would typically give 20 second cycles, maybe two cycles or 20 second, three cycles, I would give the same amount. I haven't had to lower the dosimetry. The study that I mentioned that we had published 118 sessions, we did not change the dosimetry because those individuals were on either antiplatelet therapy or Coumadin plus aspirin. Were we able to give the same amount of therapy? Excellent. Next question. In your experience, how quickly do you achieve dysphagia relief with spray cryo versus how does that relate to radiation? That's a great question. So um, the typical for radiation is going to be what we use in a neoadjuvant, a definitive approach is about six weeks of, of time, going about five days a week. That's how they just do the dosimetry around the gray. Sometimes they'll reduce that if it's for palliation only. What we have to remember with radiation is initially they're going to get some um, inflammatory response. So sometimes patients actually get worse in the very beginning. There is no head-to-head -head study, so I don't want to make claims that don't exist putting cryoablation against head-to-head -head with uh, radiation. However, what I can say is you know, we've had some, some really great responses. And like I said, we've been part of one study that already is getting published, and then another study with combination of cryo plus plus chemo, both were prospective cohort studies. And what we find is it really depends on how bulky the disease is, but sometimes patients can get relief even in that first session. It depends on, again, what percentage of the lumen is occluded, how far stenosis and occluded it is, and the bulkiness of that disease. What the other value is, is to not wait, let patients wait too long. So as I mentioned, um, I'll bring patients back every couple of weeks. Uh, another individual who I've done some, some studies with, Tupac Kashami, has brought people back even as quickly as one week to make sure that they get that ablative therapy. They have also less side effects. So, you know, when we ablate individuals with spray cryotherapy, 
they usually feel really good. They don't get the type of um, burning sensation, chest pain that you might get with other ablative therapies or with radiation. Uh, they really have no complaints. Um, so I think that's, that's something, tolerance is something that's important as well. You actually just answered one of the questions. There was a question about uh, post-procedural um, discharge um, and what is the post-procedural pain? So you kind of already addressed that. What about post-procedural discharge instructions for your patients? Yeah, um, so you know, I, you'll be surprised. So if you take someone and you convert them, like so I've given examples of patients that have refractory RFA, that individual that I mentioned who was treated at the University of Chicago and the Cleveland Clinic, it kept moving, it came to us. Well, we went to cryoablation. What he was expecting was the similar sensation and feeling that he would get when he got RFA, uh, which means that he would get some chest pain, sometimes have dysphagia that's bad enough that he would have liquids only that day or maybe for a couple of days before he could recover. Here, individuals, we tell them, go back on your diet. You're already on your medications and uh, you should be able to advance your diet to a full diet that day, uh, if not, you know, as soon as you recover from the anesthesia. And we've not found that to fail. Uh, patients feel very little discomfort to no discomfort, which is odd. You know, we tell them that, you know, even non-surgical therapy for other ablative therapies, but the reality is anyone who's done a lot of uh, ablation understands that you're going to have some patients with some, some significant chest pain. In this case, uh, we just don't experience that with, with spray cryotherapy. And I think it's because, again, we're cooling the tissues and maintaining the cellular matrix of those tissues. And so uh, patients seem to tolerate quite well. Excellent. And we have more new questions coming in. So if anyone else still has questions, feel free to put it into the chat area or the Q&A area. So uh, Dr. Sharma, uh, this reads, thanks for your presentation. Do you use the cupping technique for APC cases? And do you think it would be beneficial for these applications? Yeah, so for APC, so we don't use standard APC because we're worried about depth of penetration. But if I were, um, again, it's a non-contract therapy, so there may be some value there. I think why we are so big on cupping um, is really because you can start to lose visualization if you're not constantly rotating that scope and making sure that the spray is not coming back and, and, and hitting you, but also getting a nice even distribution. So I guess that could, that could make a lot of sense for APC. In my practice, to be honest, the only APC I'm using in the esophagus is hybrid APC, which is a newer technology. I don't know how many individuals may have exposure to it. We're uh, getting ready to be part of a study for that. But uh, definitely using the cupping um, for cryoablation. Okay, this seems to be the last question and unless anything else new comes in. Uh, Dr. Sharma, how do you approach um, RFA refractory? How many sessions do you do before you may move to a new therapy? And if you use cryotherapy, what has been the results if you were treating refractory? Uh, so great question. So the question is, you know, how do you make that decision and, and how do you decide to convert and what's considered refractory? So there have been a lot of studies that looked at what is truly refractory. And the number one thing I do when I think someone may be refractory is make sure that I've maximized acid therapy. The best study I've seen for that came from the Northwestern group at Sri Kamaduri, and they looked at individuals and they went back with, with Bravo probes and, and made sure that they truly had acid control. And oftentimes individuals don't truly have acid control. Either they're not taking enough medicine, so they need BID, PPI, because they have silent reflux, or they have these really large patchless hyal hernias that need to get repaired, or um, they're not taking the medicine right, right? So we know that PPIs can be sensitive. Once I've done that, once I know I've maximized their anti-acid medication and that they truly have acid control, then I know they're refractory. And there are individuals like that. And I give you one example today in the case-based scenario. So again, make sure that you've maximized the PPI therapy that you truly think you have acid control. If you have to go back and do a pH study or a Bravo probe, do that. Once you know you've maximized that, that's when I consider them refractory after they've had, let's say, three sessions of, of RFA. With three sessions of RFA, you know that you should expect at least around a 30% reduction of disease, if not more, maybe 50%, depends on how much disease they have and what percentage of circumference there is. At that point, I'll switch them over to cryoablation, and you've seen what the data is. Um, I showed you a great example from, from Doug Plaskow about using it for salvage therapy, and you would expect that individuals do quite well with this salvage therapy and um, that they would have a regression of their disease. And you should be able to tell that again after one or two sessions of cryoablation uh, that you're getting some regression. Okay, excellent. Uh, that seems to be the last question. So uh, Dr. Strama, thank you so much. We appreciate your time this evening. You did a wonderful job. We appreciate all your insight. Uh, this concludes today's presentation and Q&A.
Thank you for joining us. For more information about any of the Steris endoscopy products, please visit us at steris.com. And again, Dr. Sharma, thank you very much. We very much appreciate it. Have a great night, everyone. Uh -huh.